Uh, so it's my privilege once again to be lecturing to you on the subject of Christ in the Psalms. Now Christ in the Psalter is a vast and a complex subject. The nature of the title and the number of Psalms mean that it's quite hard to avoid a fragmentary approach. The Psalms are quite busy. And to help integration, therefore, with the topic, I want to look at it from two angles and use some Psalms to illustrate the point and drive it home. We're going to look at two things. Firstly, the problem, largely with definition, and then the principles that undergird the Psalter, and then we're going to look at the practice. So firstly, the problem. Not all agree what messianic means when it comes to the Psalms. Uh, Murray, for example, sees Christ in every page. Uh, Futado thinks that no, no Psalms speak of Christ uh, exclusively, but finally all do. He fulfills them all. Kidner, Walke and Eveson uh, see some Psalms, certainly Messianic, and Jesus at least claims one. We know that for certain, Psalm 110, he believed it spoke of him. I would probably see uh, quite a few more. Uh, Dale Ralph Davies, however, is dubious about this, and to be fair, I understand his point, because a broad brush stroke of Christ all over the Psalter hardly paints the whole content of the book of the Psalms. You know, perhaps he's concerned that law must be preached as well as gospel from the Psalms so that the law crushes to lead us to Christ. And that's a good point to make. All scripture does point to Jesus, but of course it does so in varied and sometimes or even often complex ways. Yes, we need to be simple, but not simplistic, especially when it comes to preaching and applying the Old Testament text. A knee-jerk approach simply just does not do justice to Christ. So we have to be careful. Some are guilty, uh, Davis, thinks of Messiah overreach by Emmaus Road overread. Uh, the trip wasn't circuitous, it was quite short, and so Jesus wouldn't have had time to explain absolutely all texts of Scripture. So simply what that text properly interpreted seems to be saying, Davis says, is that he picked key texts to teach and to shine and to burn in the hearts from all parts of the old a testament corpus or the whole body of material and yet by way of response there are some things we can say perhaps many things we can say to Davis as we maybe take a broader view of what it means to be Messiah in the Psalter and how frequently Christ is present and seen in the Psalter the first point concerns our dullness. I have actually 13 points here. Because as I look at flesh, myself and the church far too often, surely it is like Cleopas and companion, we are dull and slow of heart. And for that, Christ would rebuke us. Of course, we should see him more in the Old Testament and pertinently today in the Psalter. Surely the far greater risk is not Messiah mania, but minimalization of Messiah or missing them all together in the scripture. So that's the first thing done. The second thing is promise. Because after the Garden of Eden, after the fall into sin, each text in scripture grows from and links organically to it's connected into the snake crusher promise of Genesis 3 15 and so the whole of Christian scripture is really from that point on gradually developing progressively Christ to come focused regulated 
and therefore to be applied in that way. So there's dullness and there's promise. And then thirdly, there's the apostles. We have to think about the apostles. The apostles see Christ where many do not. And so we're to take the hint from them, do the hard work on the text and context, praying for the light and assistance of the Holy Spirit. We're to milk the doctrine from the text and then we shall see Jesus far more clearly and frequently than we first thought possible or even have been taught to expect. So there's dullness, promise and the apostles. The fourth thing is the horizons. Our messianic horizons, I think, need to broaden and expand. Word study experts warn us not to limit the topic of words, uh, the topic to words like King, Messiah, the anointed of the Lord, crown or palace or even David. We have to look more broadly than that. And did not Luther call the Psalter a mini Bible, I think he did, a, a compendium of all the doctrines of the Old Testament gathered up into one. If that's true then I think we need to expand our uh, semantic domain, our range of vocabulary and we need to take down a baby bark off and do some systematics also because we should look for Christ in his single person, one mediator, his duplex nature, God-man, his triplex office, prophet, priest and king. In all his earth, heaven, history, in his work, his, his conception, birth, growth, life, his obedience, submission, his mission, his passion, his exaltation and session and coming again in judgment and all his government of the cosmos, the church and state for Jesus Christ is Lord over every inch. He says it's mine as Kuiper tells us. So we need broad messianic horizons. Look out, see Christ, go to God's spec savers and get new spiritual three dimensional glasses to open your eyes to a multifaceted, multi-dimension, mediatorial Messiah. So there's dullness, promise, apostles, horizons. Fifthly, revelation. Because it's a triune God, of course, who reveals himself in Scripture. Yet, none at any time has ever seen the Father, and we only behold Yahweh, Jehovah, the covenant God, in the face of Jesus of Nazareth. So as psalm singers, readers, and preachers, we should be able to say of Messiah Jesus, we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father. There's dullness, apostles, horizons, revelation, and there's the shape of the salt of the way it's organized. Because scholars in recent decades have studied the shape of the Psalter. Gerard Wilson uh, helps us pick up royal hints, although he's not always convincing in his Work, but he makes a general point the seams of the Psalter books are royal, so the chief theme is Messiah. It's probably O. Palmer Robertson who's presented us with the most comprehensive and tantalizing book, His Flow of the Psalter. And I tend to agree with him that Ezra is the man who, by spiritual gift and secular grant of the Persian authorities, was given the task to edit and publish this hymn book in its finished, finalised form. When did that take place? After the death of David, when there was no king on the throne of the Jews, having returned from exile. So it was for second temple use, so that in a fresh way, it might create the messianic expectancy and focus Jews on Christ. And if we doubt that, Zechariah 3 and 5 should remove any doubt for Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, and Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, were men who were signs and symbols of things to come, the branch, the final priest-king messiah, the Davidic servant, 
and Christ. And so the arrangement of the Psalter is broadly this. It's dealing with the kingdom of David. That's its overall thrust and theme because he was the Old Testament pop-up picture book of Christ, David, uh, and the kingdom is entered in book one, established, book two, endangered, book three, enduring, book four, expected and enjoyed in book five, as the time travellers of the Psalter journey through from the start to finish, from lament to praise, from suffering to glory in book 1, 1 to 41, book 2, 42 to 72, book 3, 73 to 89, book 4, 90 to 106, and book 5, finally 107 to 150. So there's dullness, there's apostles, horizons, revelation, the shape of the Psalter, all uh, uh, making the Psalter a strongly messianic book in production. Then seventhly, there's the covenant, because God gave David an oath through Nathan. Yahweh swore to David concerning his dominion, his kingdom, his, his dynasty, his line, and his divine son. And all of that undergirds the Psalter and colours all the prayers and praises of the Psalms. Now it's true that the promise, the actual wording, does make room for many sons of David, his physical successors, but the New Testament informs us David was a prophet, and if we trust Luke Acts, which I'm sure you do, uh, we're told that David saw and spoke of one Christ to come, who would sort out sin, rise from the dead, and ever rule on the throne of David as God. Second Samuel says, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So if we grasp that the promise to Adam, Noah, Abram and Moses peaks with David, then it should dawn upon us why exile was so scary in prospect and horrendous in experience. It's as if history had pressed the pause button on God's new Eden and everlasting salvation program. If there is no David on the throne, if there is no temple or kingdom, then there's no forgiveness of sin and everlasting life. It's all been a, a mistake. Which of course they knew it wasn't. But the fear is there. They, it was a traumatic calamity they exiled to Babylon in 586 BC. David or no then, David or no David uh, spells hope or doom. The difference between life and death, heaven or hell. So if Psalm 90 at the start of book 4 pulls hearts back with the reassurance that everything is well in God's world with God's kingdom for the Lord reigns, the Yahweh Malak Psalms, then it's because Psalm 89 has perched the Jews on a knife edge and a cliff edge of curse. We hear this in Psalm 89, 35 to uh, 39. Once for all I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His offspring shall endure forever, his throne as long as the sun before me. But now you have cast off and rejected. You are full of wrath against your anointed. You have renounced the covenant with your servant. You have defied his crown in the dust. How long, O Lord, will you hide yourself forever? Lord, where is your steadfast love of old, which by your faithfulness you swore to David. So there is dullness, there's apostles, there's horizons, there's revelation, there's the ship of the Psalter, the covenant promise, and then there's the exile, eighthly. Exile, of course, was no accident of history, because if Solomon asked God to hear prayers on 
the day God's people were far away in a distant land and turned towards the house, Moses had foretold that as even as they set sail for Canaan's shoreline, that before another mosaic mediator or mediator like himself would come, dreams would end in tears, but it wouldn't be for too long. Deuteronomy 28, 64 to 65 and 30. Uh, 1 to 3 say and the Lord will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other and when all these things come upon you the blessing and the curse which I have set before you and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you and return to the Lord your God then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you and he will gather you again from all peoples If Israel's royal blueprint fell apart at the seams and kingdom schism caused both nations north and south to veer downhill to exile, this was not chance or fate, but simply a salutary chapter in the unfolding story of God's glory as the sovereign purpose of Yahweh, the covenant God, was worked out in faithfulness. If oath enjoyment rested on the obedience of faith by grace, oath endurance was never in doubt or conditioned upon obedience. And so the kingdom sketch and scaffold had to be put up and brought down to make way for the flesh and bones on the structure of the final kingdom and church and the artwork, the masterpiece of King Messiah himself. So we have dullness, we have promise, apostles, horizons, revelation, shape of the psalter, the covenant, the exile, and then there's worship, ninthly. You see, temple worship aimed from the start to concentrate minds of worshippers on Messiah. It was the grace received from Calvary flowing back to them by the Holy Spirit as they gazed on the shadows and types of the law that saved them and cleansed those who truly believed and look to him. The plans for God's house were entrusted to Moses but the music and lyrics were assigned to David. So the bells and smells, the structures and scriptures, the feast beasts and priests of the temple all pointed to Messiah. And so it's prayers and praises were bequeathed by David posthumously after his death to God's flock to focus them on the coming Christ. But these factors, I think, need to be considered before we simply say that Christ is not on every page. We see then the dullness, the promise, the apostles, the horizons, the shape of the psalter, the covenant, the worship, the exile. Uh, what about the best route to get to Christ, the route from David to Christ? Well, there are many safe guides, aren't there, like Calvin and Fairburn and Murray and Gray Danis has done a great favour to the Reformed community in showing us how to get to Christ. That book was really groundbreaking in present day terms and yet it can be a little bit formulaic and probably we should avoid strictly drawing lines from the New Testament to Christ. Uh, uh, perhaps Sinclair Ferguson, as someone has said, is correct in this that we need more to have an approach which soaks ourselves in scripture and relies on the Holy Spirit to help us get a spiritual nose for these things, a messianic instinct. And certainly the late Ed Clowney, who was a great service to God's people, gives some basic checks in this process. We're to study the context and milk all the doctrine out and then ask how Christ fulfills those doctrines. And then if we want to check it with the New 
Testament. So that's the root, really developing a deep knowledge of scripture and theology and bringing this broad horizon to bear on the original context and then simply ask the question, where is Jesus in this passage? So the eleventh thing is a point about scripture. Uh, some insist we must guard the single meaning of scripture as we should. Uh, because when God's Spirit spoke through the prophets of the Lord, surely they didn't speak with forked tongue or with double entendre. Of course, there's no way they could have known everything that would take place and exactly how it would unfold. They hadn't seen Christ in the fullness of New Testament light. Scripture is progressive in that sense. And yet, words must mean what they say. And what they knew, they said we need to safeguard the single meaning and the dual authorship of Scripture. The human author, the divine author. Uh, Francis Turden helps us here in his Elendic Theology, uh, where he talks about the Scripture and the single meaning of Scripture. He says that the, I'm paraphrasing here, the meaning of Scripture is always one. No, but that one meaning can be simple or complex. It can be simple, it can be literal or figurative or metaphorical, or simply or complex, uh, like two parts that interlock or three or four parts that join together to comprise the whole, like a seal and stamp, shadow and substance, coin and its mould, which makes it the type and the anti-type both David and Christ contained in the one meaning, simple or complex. And we might ask as well with respect to scripture, why does the Spirit use such vivid, colourful, historical, pop-up picture language so much? Uh, there are many reasons for this, I think. Uh, but mainly so singers would look to the faithful, consistent I am God of his covenant people, Yahweh, who had acted in past glory according to the eternal consistency of his nature in the days of David and will in the future do exactly or similar things again, but only with bigger, better, brighter glory in the times and days of Messiah, the seed goes into bud and blossom and fruit finally in Christ. And that thrills God's people's hearts and gets God all the praise and the glory for his wisdom. Now the twelfth point uh, concerns the function. There's just uh, 13 points. The function of the Psalter. The Psalter is unique, I think, in how it functions because like no other book, at least not so much, the Psalter is both the Word of God to us and the Word of God in us. In the Psalter, God speaks to man, but also man articulates his responsive speech to God. And that surely makes a big difference as to how Psalms should be used. Because Jesus was the only ever perfect pious Jew, the only person who actually ever sang the Psalms properly and with full understanding. Uh, and as a perfect pious Jew, Jesus is man use psalms to praise and to pray with loud cries and tears and Hebrews tells us he was heard because of his reverent submission. Yet he also blessed and trusted his father as his maker, keeper and saviour because he prayed these psalms as man. God man of course. And the thirteenth thing it concerns application. 
Finally, since we only reach God through the blood of Christ, every song in this book must look to Jesus for grace in repentance and faith. It's his spirit only that imputes and imparts help to us. And if we have grace in the heart, how can we sing and not see Christ? Christ is everywhere. And if that's true, it seems I also suffer from the syndrome of Mary Messiah mania. So we've looked at the problem and hopefully resolved it. In so many ways, we need to give a great weight and import to the covenant with David and the purpose of the Psalter. In conclusion then, Emmaus changed forever how Cleopas used the Psalter and it cured his heartburn. It gave him heartburn and cured it at the same time. Uh, blindness therefore not overreach or overread is my worry about a mess and how we use the Psalter in particular. Don't be left guessing like the Ethiopian eunuch. Tell me Philip of whom do these Psalms speak about the prophet David or someone else? Of course David's not the only author but he's one of the chief. From my earliest days I drank Psalms and my milk and I suppose by grace I have a love affair with this book. Nights rarely pass without some psalm in my brain and I fear few things more than singing out of tune with Christ and his spirit. And so I pray that my path would be one of prayer and praise with him in pleasure or in pain. And if I fall short of that, all failure is with me, not him. And I pray that for you too. May the Lord bless you in your use of and study of the Psalms. We're called, aren't we, as Christians, to joy with those who joy and weep with those who weep. And so at my bed are theirs, and your bed and theirs. May you share the thrills and spills of the Psalms in Messiah's songs and tears. May God bless you. Amen.